Hi, and thanks for joining us. Our top story takes a close look at the European Union urging compliance with the UN Security Council's Gaza ceasefire resolution. Later, we direct our attention to the Commercial Bank of Ethiopia. They reported recovering nearly 80% of the funds lost in a system glitch. And in our POV segment, we explore the semiconductor surge of future trends and market dynamics in Southeast Asia. Dr. Carl Lee from the Institute of China Studies in UM helps us understand this a little better. All this and more coming up shortly. I'm Jesse Chahel. This has been The World on Bernama TV. To begin the world with this, Qatar's foreign ministry has revealed that the UN Secretary Council or Security Council's ceasefire resolution hasn't affected talks in Doha. The US absentation angered Israel, prompting the cancellation of a high-level delegation visit to Washington. Both parties involved in the Israel-Hamas conflict are rejecting international mediation. Israel is aiming to dismantle Hamas, while Hamas is seeking a permanent ceasefire, also seeking troop withdrawal and prisoner release. Meanwhile, the European Union is urging compliance with the UN Security Council's Gaza ceasefire resolution, echoing its previous calls for a humanitarian pause. Israel's frustration mounts as the US opts to abstain from the vote. What we have been stressing since the adoption of this resolution is also not only the importance of the text, but also the importance of urgent implementation by all parties. So this is very important. Of course, I mean, this resolution is fully in line with the conclusions of the European Council from last week. You know that we've been calling for uh, immediate humanitarian pause leading to a sustainable ceasefire. Now we have the resolution of the Security Council and the resolutions of the Security Council are basically generally considered to be international law. So it is foreseen in the UN Charter that the member states of the UN respect and implement the resolutions of the Security Council and comply with them. So this is, uh, this is the basis based on which we will, be, we will be engaging and working further in order to end the humanitarian suffering in Gaza and also to advance the only sustainable solution which we see to the overall problem, and that's the two-state solution. In New York, the United States has abstained from the UN Security Council resolution due to its lack of condemnation of Hamas. Negotiation efforts by the US and Qatar, as well as Egypt, to secure a ceasefire and hostage release have halted. The White House has urged Israel to avoid a major ground operation in Rafah, citing concerns about a potential humanitarian catastrophe. Meanwhile, the U.S. Deputy Ambassador Robert Wood has expressed regret over Russia and China's obstruction of council action, emphasizing the importance of international cooperation in addressing the ongoing crisis. Over in Beirut, the leader of Lebanon's Islamic group aligning with Hamas and Hezbollah announced close coordination along the Israel-Lebanon border. Inspired by the Muslim Brotherhood, the group cited the Israeli aggression as a reason for joining the conflict. Despite historical disputes, they've aligned with Hamas, carrying out independent attacks using their own weapons. Lebanon is claiming that the Israeli occupation in the disputed areas is further fueling their resistance. In Russia, its Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has stated that Russia rejects the Western assistance in the, invest in the investigation of the Moscow concert hall attack, claiming it would show double standards. His statement followed President Putin's implication of Ukrainian involvement. And despite the IS claiming responsibility, Putin insists on Ukrainian culpability, a notion Ukraine denies, accusing Putin of manipulating the situation for his war efforts. 
And in Myanmar, UN expert Tom Andrews has reported that Myanmar's junta is facing substantial setbacks, leading to more civilian attacks. Rohingya communities continue to suffer, prompting Andrews to urge global intervention to curb junta funding and weapons amid humanitarian crisis and criminal networks. Not getting adequate food rations. Uh, they're expected. There has been a five-fold increase in attacks, aerial attacks on civilians. And the reason for this is, is that for them, it's dangerous for their troops to move around on the ground. So instead, they're taking uh, the aerial, uh, air, the aircraft that they've been able to obtain from abroad and bomb villages, IDP centers, and kill innocent civilians. The problem that we have right now is that humanitarian aid is not going in the, to the areas that need it most. And I'm talking about the conflict areas, the areas outside of, uh, this, of, of SAC uh, administered areas of the country. This is the, the fastest growing part of the country. Uh, that is where most of the people, growing numbers of people in the country that need humanitarian aid are. There are 18.6 million people who are in need of humanitarian aid. In a tragic incident, a cargo ship lost power and collided with the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, causing its collapse and plunging it into the river. The crash occurred in the early hours with six, six construction workers on the bridge presumed dead. Now, authorities managed to limit traffic before the collision, averting further casualties. This incident could potentially disrupt vital shopping port or rather shipping port operations for months to come. I'm off to a break now. When I return, I'll be speaking to Dr. Carl Lee on the West China semiconductor industry. Be right back. Welcome back. You're watching The World on Bernama TV. Southeast Asia's tech industry is a focal point where geopolitics meets technological innovation. European and American firms expand while China's or rather China secures supply chains. Ideological differences are shaping strategies, impacting investment decisions. And more initiatives like the ASEAN Economic Community foster growth, but also draws concerns about sovereignty that persists. Navigating these challenges demands strategic foresight, both to also unlock sustainable growth in the region's dynamic tech sector. Joining me today is Dr. Carl Lee from the Institute of China Studies at UM to share his thoughts. Doctor, thank you for doing this. Let's look at some key factors now that are driving the recent trends we see of European and American companies expanding their operations uh, progressively and actively uh, within Southeast Asia's electrical and electronics manufacturing sector. Okay. Uh the key factors, uh, yeah, I mean, of course, the, we know that uh, the, uh, the West, uh, US led Western uh, uh, camp and China are not in, uh, are having their own divergent uh, ways of uh, risking each other from uh, each other's supply chain. So, uh, from the uh, US led uh, Western countries, uh, uh, this particular, particular concept is called the risking, uh, the risking of China. Of supply chain and for China uh, uh, perspective, uh, they also wanted to de risk, uh, de risk from uh, the dependence of Western uh, chip, uh, uh, Western chips and even other technologies. So basically, these two things are uh, uh, happen in tandem that allow uh, more European and American companies uh, to search for greener pasture. Or even diversify uh, their uh, supply suppliers um, out of uh, China itself. Mm -hmm. We look at some of the um, you know uh, strengths here, and it does look like China is undertaking 
all it can to secure its crucial supply chains in sectors where it could face potential disruption or interference from Western powers. What particular measures uh, or other is China taking at this point to secure um, its crucial supply chains? So China has put in a lot of, uh, let's say, capitals, money, investments uh, into its uh, domestic uh, suppliers, domestic producers uh, of all these uh, chips, uh, equipment, uh, even uh, packaging and testing of these uh, semi uh, semiconductor. Uh, even for uh, the substrate, uh, China also is doing the same, uh, putting in many uh, building up a lot of these uh, domestic companies uh, from scratch. I mean, some even uh, some even just uh, some companies just get the funding uh, the moment they just open their companies. And of course, uh, yeah, they are the the impacts of this or the effect of this uh, kind of uh, massive funding uh, is uh, very among each other. So some companies are uh, doing better. Some companies uh, didn't do well at all. So it all depends uh, on uh, whether these companies have been uh, um, uh, able to tap on this massive fund for their own future development. From what I see right now, uh, China is uh, uh, concentrating on two companies. One is Huawei, uh, and the other is uh, SMIC. Uh, they are own chip makers. Uh, it's equivalent to Taiwan's uh, TSMC. So they are trying to concentrate on these two uh, makers instead of uh, spreading a lot of the funding to different uh, domestic uh, companies. So uh, this is the latest uh, strategy they are embarking on. Right. It's basically okay. to ensure their self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. With so much activity and focus uh, in Southeast Asia uh, in terms of its response to uh, technological advancements and also the shifts in uh, market demands, how do you foresee the semiconductor indus industry evolving? Uh, here within the Southeast Asian uh, belt? Uh, you know, first, uh, uh, first of all, we are, will be the most uh, most quoted uh, party in uh, this entire uh, supply chain um, of, uh, in, of the semiconductor industry. Uh, and may, uh, reasons are many. Uh, one of them is that we have uh, several countries uh, here that have a certain level of uh, semiconductor presence uh, within the supply chain. So it is uh, very natural for them to uh, find uh, a, a place, a locations like us here, which have uh, cheaper labor costs, costs and then and, and then it will for them to utilize our, uh, our countries as spaces uh, to export to uh, the consumer markets like the US, for example. We take a look at so, what yeah. is um, now, uh, you know, happening as well. The ASEAN Economic um, uh, sort of I initiative. How does this regional economic integration going to help the overall uh, landscape in terms of the growth as well of the tech sector within Southeast Asia? So, as we started to see the surge of uh, semiconductor investments or semiconductor related investments uh, coming to this region. Uh, we also need to contemplate further, yeah. You know, uh, instead of uh, just uh, uh, let's say uh, doing in individually to uh, attract these investors to come to uh, each of our countries in Southeast Asia, what we can do is really to find a way to work together. Uh, like what our deputy trade minister again uh, emphasized the vertical integration uh, concept of the supply chain, where each country can take a certain position or certain role within the entire supply chain. And then we, instead of competing with each other, we work with each other to ensure that uh, we, all of us will benefit from each other, uh, from the from the whole uh, reconfiguration or reorganization of the uh, global supply chain in the semiconductor sector. But here's one, Doctor. Um, how can Southeast Asian countries um, or even the forefront players what can they do in terms of balancing the need of things like um, foreign investment in the tech sector while there are still concerns about being over-reliant to um, you know, external factors and perhaps even the potential loss of their market share in that sense? 
well, yeah, essentially it will still up to the individual Southeast Asian countries to really do their work. It's, it's, it's not just uh, like uh, uh, we just uh, sit there and then the investments will come and then we will enjoy the we reap the benefits from there. Right? It's actually right. uh, it doesn't it's not that easy. Yeah, uh, it's not that I uh, mean smooth selling because uh these uh these semiconductor investors they come in for certain reasons like do we have enough uh adequate uh skill labor skill labor for them to utilize on do we have enough uh resources because uh these uh, eventually when they set up the factories in uh, particular Southeast Asian countries, they all use a lot of water, electricity, you know. So, and also the regulatory regime. Do we have a very friendly regulatory regime uh, for the foreign investors to come to uh, their own, to each of the Southeast Asian countries? So all these are long-standing limitations that we haven't really, uh, or even still in the middle of dealing after many years. You know? mm -hmm. So eventually, it's still up to individual countries to really uh, beef up all these things and then if, before we go up and then uh, before we can actively uh, attract all these uh, semiconductor investors from overseas. Right. It's, of course, you know, through that Southeast Asia's uh, tech industry is the hot spot right now. And so much needs to be done to unlock its full potential for sustainable growth and prosperity. Uh, Doc, we will check in with you soon again for more on these topics. Till then, take care. We're taking a quick uh, breather right now. Stay with me for more global updates back soon right here on Bernama TV. You're watching Bernama World. Welcome back to the world. Of course, we move on with international updates at this point. They've denied allegations of cyber espionage by the US and UK targeting officials, journalists and corporations. The Foreign Ministry spokesperson Lin Jian has dismissed the accusations as political manipulation. This campaign that dates back to 2010 was aimed to harass critics, steal trade secrets and spy on political figures. Now the US Justice Department charged seven hackers believed to be in China while the UK has imposed sanctions over a breach potentially exposing voter data. Amidst all of this, China urges for an end to the politics, politics of cyber issues. As we move on to Portugal, Portugal's newly elected minority government, led by Luis Montenegro, is facing challenges as cracks emerge in parliamentary alliances. The centre-right alliance won by a slim margin, with the Socialist Party coming in second. The hard-right Chega Party's surge complicates matters at this point, demanding a role in governance. Montenegro's minority government may struggle to pass legislation without support, potentially leading to further political upheaval. Now we zoom into this story in the Philippines. India's Foreign Minister Jay Shankar met with his counterpart in Manila, emphasizing the adherence to international law amid the tensions in the South China Sea. Recent attempts by Chinese ships to obstruct vessels from Philippines underscore regional disputes. Both nations are advocating for a free and inclusive Indo-Pacific landscape. Jeshankar's visit is aimed to strengthen regional stability through very many discussions with top Philippine officials. In Mexico, Venezuelan migrants such as Ana Primera and Edith Lebron are anxiously awaiting for U.S. asylum appointments, fearing exploitation and danger if they move north without them. Many recount harrowing experiences, including threats from drug cartels. Mexico's strategy to contain migrants in the south aims to reduce border crossings, with some Venezuelans being deported and offered financial aid to discourage future attempts. Well, still in Mexico, it is grappling with widespread forest fires across 15 states, exacerbated by severe drought conditions. The 
National Forestry Commission has reported 58 active fires affecting protected natural areas in states like Morelos, Veracruz and the state of Mexico. Approximately 1,421 acres have been impacted with Veracruz particularly hard hit where fires ravage ecological reserves and agricultural fields. In other news, the windswept village of Sprechwohl in North Germany is thriving on renewable energy, notably from wind turbines. The locals are benefiting financially, providing stability in volatile sectors like dairy farming. And this success positions the village Sprechwohl as a model for climate-friendly development, driven by community investment and government support. With that, we conclude today's broadcast. Until next time, I'm Jesse Chahel. Thank you for tuning in. This has been The World on Pranama TV.